Welcome to Rock Solid Productions, where in this video we're going to show you how to get better video quality out of your Nintendo 64 using HD Retrovision cables and Voltar's RGB mod kit. Hey everyone, Gary here with Rock Solid Productions. If this is your first time here, Welcome, what took you so long? We've been here for like a year now at least. You took you long enough. I'm just kidding. Welcome, if this is your first time here, make sure you hit that subscribe button. That way each and every time we do come out with new content, you are alerted via email and hit that bell notification too. That way you do get those extra notifications like when we go live streaming, all those extra little things that you get by hitting the subscribe button and the benefits that you get. It helps the channel too, I'd appreciate it. So the Nintendo 64 is one of my favorite consoles that has some of the biggest problems to date. The stock controller isn't very good. It tends to wear out, especially the analog stick. Well, Retro Fighters has come out with a solution to that with the Brawler 64. I love this controller and I've been playing my Nintendo 64 a ton more since I've gotten this. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you check out our review in the upper right hand corner there uh, using the gimmick really love this controller. The other thing is the N64 came at a period in time where Nintendo was still hanging on to cartridges and they were also relying on some tricks inside the machine itself to project an image up on a CRT TV at the time. Well, we're all using flat panels now for the most part. There are some holdouts that still love using their CRTs and that's great. Now, connecting this to my modern TV it looks like garbage. I mean, we live streamed recently. This is using the cool digital AV to HDMI adapter, which it looked better, but man, it still looked like a smudgy mess. Now, HD Retrovision has a set of component video cables that will plug into the stock connector here on the back of the N64. It's the same connector type as what you will find in the Super NES and the Super NES Junior. It's this connector port right here. The thing with this though is the, the original Super NES supports RGB component video out right out of the box. The Nintendo 64 does not. And that's where Voltar.com comes in. Voltar has been making these awesome RGB mod chips for years. He's really a sharp dude and he has a great kit design for the N64. Now, to install it, you are going to need some basic tools and skills. You're going to need a couple game bits, you're going to need a Phillips head screwdriver, you're also going to need, above and beyond the adapter itself, you're going to need a soldering iron, preferably with a pencil tip and soldering skills. This would be for the intermediate to advanced modder, I would say. If you're not comfortable soldering, if you're worried about screwing something up, Voltar can install it for you. Now, now, I've been soldering for over 25 years. I feel very comfortable about doing it, so I'm going to do the mod myself. A couple other things. You'll want 6040 rosin core solder. Absolutely never, ever use acid core solder. You're going to ruin your components. And I'm not a huge proponent of using solder flux or solder paste, uh, but watching their recommendations as far as their installation videos, they recommend using it. So why go against the grain there? I'm going to try it here. So we're going to take the machine apart. And basically, I have a secondary unit right here. And this is what it will look like once you get it freed from the plastic casing, remove the heat sink. Now, I will show you removing the heat sink. You actually don't necessarily have to. The other thing when you go to test your system after you've completed it, make sure you put the heat sink back on. If you don't, your system may overheat and you may damage the CPU, GPU, or both. And then this mod is all for naught. So let's turn to the bench and let's get started. So here we have our N64 on our bench here. And one of the things I really want you to take a look is just how small the mod chip is there is absolutely nothing to it whatsoever first of all of course pull out any games that you might have next we are going to need to pull out any ram carts that might be in here um, easiest way to do it i've found quite often is you can use the lid to pop it out back tab on there there we go flipping the system over we will need to uh, remove the security screws that are underneath here 
And for that, we will be using a security bit screwdriver. And for this, let's just check here real quick. Now, before we get too far here, one thing I do want to point out as well, as we pull out our first screw, the serial number on your unit is extremely important to whether or not you can even utilize this mod. If you do not have an NS1 serial number, the odds of this working for you are slim. Some of these feet should pop off. There's one. There's two, the screw pulled off with that, so throw that in there. We'll wash these up. Everything that you see here will get a good cleaning before it gets put back together. Got a couple of threads just kind of fighting to hang on. There we have that. Here's the top of it. You can see there's like some fuzz and other crud in here. Again, this will all get cleaned up before we put this all back together. Flip this over, which will release the screws. So now, I mean, you can see all the crud and dust and whatnot that's in here. Uh, one of the things you really should do as you're going through and doing this is use like some kind of a, a dust cleaner and just clean this off. And that won't get all of it off. What I really recommend doing too is using like Dynamite Magnum Force 2. It's safe for use on electronic components with like a soft bristle brush that you can used to get this crud off of here. So we'll go through and we'll clean that up in a little bit. Now, one other thing that I have too, is I have my Hitachi uh, power screwdriver. I have the clutch set pretty loose on here so we can undo these screws. So one of the things that we'll need to do is we'll need to undo these and those. And I believe the ones are on the edges as well need to come off. Do not force anything apart here as you are uh, disassembling the system because that's just going to hurt things in the long run. It's not coming out. There's a reason why. Note that these are much longer than the ones that were up front. Now, one thing I've heard is that you do not need to take out all these screws to get the system out. Um, to do this mod, I am taking them all out simply again, so I can just do, and one just fell, just do a really thorough cleaning of all the components before I put it back together. All those out. So aside, and again, I'll end up cleaning this off. I mean, just look at all the, the dust and crap that, that built up in here over the years. I think these two guys gotta come out too. I'm going to look how small but long that they are. There we go. Now the system will pull right out. As you can see, this part just popped right out. And the part for the power supply just stays right on. Look how dusty and dirty that is. You do have these inserts in here that you will want to make sure that you don't misplace. But this is something that a little bit of just soap and water and a little bit of armor all will do us a whole lot of good. So at this point, we're going to remove the shielding on here. There we go. There we go. And again, we're going to clean up all these metal bits as well just to make sure that uh, it stays as clean as possible moving forward. So one thing on here, this is revision three on this board. That is important to note. I do have some crap crud and corrosion there, which is no bueno. So where the board itself will end up going is essentially right here is where it's gonna go. And it'll sit on the board just like that. So what we'll end up doing is soldering that into place we are looking for R8, R9, and R10 right here on the board is actually where we're looking for. I need to prep my wire. So I'm gonna go like that and like that to measure my length. So we're gonna make it about that long. I come in here. So that's the length of the wire that I need right there. Now, before I solder to the board, there's a couple things I need to make sure to do. The first thing first is to make sure that I clean the board where I'm going to be soldering to. So again, I'm going to use just a little bit of Magnum Force on a Q-tip here. And we're just going to wipe that down here. And again, we're going to R10, R9, and R8. So there is a little bit of dirt and dust that did come off 
on the cotton swab here as I was doing this. And set that aside to dry. You wanna have a good quality soldering iron. I am actually using my Track Power soldering iron, and I do have a pencil tip on here versus a chisel tip that'll make sure that uh, I get the proper heat application without overheating and damaging the components. You know, a fairly thin gauge solder here I'm using too. You wanna make sure that you tin your tip properly and then keep your tip clean when not in use. I do also have some flux, which normally I don't use. However, every tutorial that I've seen for doing this highly recommends using flux, so I'm going to follow along. Now I have stripped down my wires here, and the main thing is you wanna have these fairly short. You don't wanna have them very long because uh, you do not want them to go through these holes and actually hit the pins on the other side or lift the pins off the other side. So we're gonna solder again, R10, R9, R8. So I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna take these, I'm gonna put a little bit of flux on here and just dunk it straight into the flux and we'll tin that in a second. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna take the other end of my Q-tip that I just used, I'm gonna dip it in my flux here, and I'm gonna put just a, a little bit of it, eight, nine, and 10. You just wanna have enough there to help the solder and everything flow. And if you have too much, don't worry, you can always wipe it off, that's not an issue. So the thing to remember when you are tinning is you need to apply your heat from your soldering iron to the metal and not to the solder itself. That one's tinned. That one's tinned. That one's tinned. Now, when I did that, it actually melted some of the insulation back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim these wires to make sure that I don't have an issue with uh, the wires basically being too long. So we're gonna you can see how short the leads are. You don't need much on here. And actually now that these are tinned, I'm going to put just a little bit more flux on the ends. So in here, just set it in R10. Let's give it a tiny touch. And there, and that one is tacked down. Actually it worked very well. I'm very happy with how that worked. Tack down R9. And tack down R8. There we go. Now all three of those wires are tacked down to the board, but I'm gonna hit it again with just a touch of solder to make sure everything adheres the way that it really should. All right, now that those are in place, what I wanna do is I wanna take this and fold it over because my wires actually become a little bit crisscross. And actually I can shorten this if I wanted to. Um, but there is my B, G, R. So B is brown, which is in the middle. And this is, yeah, this is just a little bit on the long side, but that's okay. Fold that over and let me just apply a little bit of flux to each of these. Again, I'm just gonna doink, doink. And all that that's doing is it's promoting adhesion of the solder itself. And lay these down. We are going to go to Make sure that you're not bridging any of the contacts either as you are doing this. And everything looks pretty clean there. And now the last thing is we need to solder everything up here. So basically with that, you'll just start at one pin and go over. And again, just make sure that you're not bridging any of those contacts. Now before I solder this part, I'm gonna also put a little bit of flux on here just again to help that's actually too much, so we'll clean that off in a second, but we want to promote adhesion of the solder. Now we'll just solder them in place one by one. So 
as you can see here, I'm heating the back of the pin and applying the solder to the front of the pin. Looks like we have good solder joints on everything there. Good solder joints on the board, good solder joints here. What we're going to need to do is solder from this R16 via to our sink right there. And once again, we're going to use a little bit of flux on the wire. Just dunk each end in there, dunk and a dunk. And then finally, I'm going to apply a little bit to the via itself. You don't need a ton and you want to clean this up after everything's all said and done. Just get a nice coat of it there. And we'll actually put a little bit where we'll solder on the board as well. And we're going to go to that via right there and just... There you go. Tack it on. That's all that it needs. go so that we have everything tacked down I know uh, watching Voltar do his he just goes straight across I'd rather have everything come up this way um, but everything is tacked down nice you know nice and tight on here nothing is loose we'll get everything put together and try it out now the Voltar RGB mod can't work miracles quite honestly you are still going to have some issues with the graphics just because of what the N64 did graphically. Now, I am running it through my OSSC, and with Star Fox here on screen, it is basically line tripling the 240p signal. Now, some games will run at 480i, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Example, so that is a line doubling, or line tripling, Hopefully this keeps the recording. Nope. Ah, did it? Yes. So there's line doubling. And here's pass through. And this will take just a moment. There we go. So there you can kind of see what just the raw signal looks like versus having some upscaling to it. And the N64 graphically is a hot mess in so many ways. Um, but I am going to go back to the line tripling, just because I think it, it does look the best, at least in 240p mode. Now, for controller, I'm actually using the Retrofighters Brawler 64. I love this controller. Now, the thing is, I'm still having to kind of learn how to use it a little bit because I'm so used to the Trident design. So, with the Brawler 64 controller, basically you have your rolls and everything is basically on either Z or... R or L, um, and this is kind of where I come at it too, that the, um, the L trigger issue is a non-issue because there's so much duplication of key presses depending on the game that you're playing. It does look quite a bit sharper. I like the sound too. I mean, I think that's one of the, um, the things here that, you know, is, is maybe sometimes lost in, you know, the N64 looked like a hot mess, but actually sounded really good in so many different games. And, I mean, overall, though, this is probably the best that I've seen my N64 look ever. The one thing on this, too, is, well, it may still kind of, you know, look blocky and like a traditional N64 game. The color palette is a lot richer and a lot deeper, and that's really where you're going to notice some of the biggest differences here is basically the the colors now that we've left the galaxy far far away we've actually decided to do some futuristic racing with f-zero x this is actually a game i've bought and really have yet to play i do like the fact that you can actually adjust your your race vehicle in this version oh polygon You know, the colors do look really rich. Again, you know, it's the anti-aliasing that really hurts the N64 today. Um, and that's some of what I need to play around with my settings on my OSSC to kind of make the most out of this system and what the Voltar mod really provides. 
I mean, now, truth be told, this is not going to give you, like, the HDMI mod for um, uh, GCHD for the Eon, or from Eon Gaming, the GCHD. It is not that sort of upgrade, but it's also not that sort of price point either. I mean, you're looking, you know, not including installation, under 50 bucks for this mod kit, and you get a dramatic increase in the visuals. And I know that some people will wonder, well, what about just those AV to HDMI adapters? This looks a thousand times better than that did. So Banjo-Kazooie is one of the great platformers for the N64 developed by Rare and is the spirit, you don't hear it often said this way, it's the spiritual successor to ukulele for the Nintendo Switch. The Brawler 64 works great. Again, this is a 240p line tripling mode. Banjo-Kazooie does not support 480i. So one of the things I noticed graphically about the N64 is just the jagged edges on the pixels. And some people don't mind it, some people do. Now one thing I'm going to do here, while we're going through, I'm gonna hit the OSSC and we're going to actually change some settings here. So now I've turned on scan lines. So, and that should soften some of the, the jagginess out of the edges and actually it really has. Banjo-Kazooie and, you know, its sequel Banjo-Tooie was just, it was one of those silly games, but it just, it was so much fun. And I'm really glad that, uh, you know, the original creators um, have formed Playtonic Games and have come out with um, Ukulele. It, it's basically everything that this game was and then some. So Banjo-Kazooie looks pretty good. And what would a look at the N64 be without a little bit of a uh, little GoldenEye? 007 GoldenEye defined the first person shooter back in the day. It was really the first of its kind. And one of the things I've just got to remember now is what the key presses are in this with this controller versus the stock one. I believe the Z trigger is shoot. It is. There's L and R. And then the D pad will, or the arrows will move you up and down. Now, the one thing I will say about this game is it does look a little bit on the dark side to me. Now, I think that's just how this game is, though. Uh, headshot, got him. This is a game I would love to see redone today with proper two-stick control. Oh, yeah. Let's see if we can get some sniping done here. Here, snipe. Here, snipe, snipe. All right, let's see how precise we can get. And we do have the scan lines on here. Whoop. Got him. So Goldeneye looking good with the scan lines on here. I'm digging that. Um, and I'm traditionally not a scan line fan, so um, this is actually looking pretty stout. Let us go ahead. Let's give you some final thoughts. So there you have it. My look at how I installed and tested out Voltar's Mod Shop RGB mod for the N64. Again, the main thing was I wanted to be able to use the HD retrovision cables with my N64, which it doesn't do natively out of the box. This system now for a small, you know, cost of an upgrade will allow me to do that. And it gives me richer, more vibrant colors pretty much on anything I can play and will allow me to upscale going through my OSSC. So don't forget too, you can get the HD retrovision cables at castlemaniagames.com. They've got everything that you need to get up and rolling with these as far as for the Super NES, for the Sega Genesis and for other systems, but you will need to do the modding for systems such as this. Um, now, if you do want to get your hands on one of the RGB kits or the RGB cables from castlemaniagames.com, go ahead and use promo code ROX10. We're going to get you free shipping and handling. I'll save you 10% on your cables too, so that'll definitely help you out. When it comes to the RGB mod kit from Voltar, I'd say it's probably third in or fourth as far as 
essential items, third or fourth for essential items that I would recommend for the N64. Number one would definitely be the one up system cleaner because if your system's dirty, you can't play. Number two would probably be timber would be the Retro Fighters Brawler 64 controller. Just this is a great controller and it makes playing games so much easier. And number three probably tied would be the RGB kit here along with the HD RetroVision cables. It just brings out the colors and the vibrance of your N64 games like you never expected. Now, temper your expectations. This is not going to give you 1080p HD. It's not going to fix what the N64 does wrong to begin with. It can't get rid of just a lot of the issues. But what it can do is for a reasonable price, give you a really great picture out of your system with great color, just overall a really good experience. You figure with the cables and the mod chip itself, if you can install it yourself, you're looking at about $100 versus you know quite a bit more if you'd want to do the HDMI mods. And it's even less than you know pre-modded consoles as well. Now this is for the intermediate to advanced modder. So again, if you don't have really good soldering skills, good technique and the right supplies, you could definitely risk ruining your system. Let me know if you have any questions or comments down below in the comments section. Um, we do answer all of our questions that we get. You can also email me your questions to rocksolidmail at gmail.com. Visit me up on Twitter at rocksolidstudios or over on our Facebook page too at facebook.com slash Productions. We answer all of our questions that we get that come through. Also go ahead, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Now one other thing that you want to stay subscribed to is not only are we going to do live streams with the RGB mod here for the N64, there's also this little bad Johnny right here. This is the Super NES Mini. And the thing about the SNES Mini is it provides a better picture than the standard Super NES. However, this out of the box does not do RGB. Voltar's Mod Shop has got us covered there. And we will be doing a tutorial showing how to install the mod kit into the Super NES Junior so we can get, again, great picture quality out of the Super NES. You can also help support the channel if you want to for as little as a dollar a month by visiting our Patreon page, patreon.com slash rock solid. And for, like I say, just a dollar a month, you can get early access to our videos. You help support the channel so we can invest in things like the OSSC, like the HD Retrovision cables, and like the Voltar Mod Shop mod chip. We do provide, like I say, early access to stuff. We get uh, exclusive one-on-one -on -one conversations going and exclusive content that are just for patrons. You can also support the channel by picking up some merch. Check out our Teespring store, which we have linked down below. You can also make donations via PayPal or from our Streamlabs page too. So the Voltar Mod Shop N64 RGB mod, it looks really, really good. I'm glad that I have it. I will definitely be enjoying my N64 a whole lot more. Um, I got a controller. I got some Mario. Let's play. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.